Hello, and thank you so much for being here. I'm Carol Hins, Editorial Director of Millbrook Press and Carota Books, and I'd like to share some of our books that we'll be releasing this fall. First up, we have Eye by Eye, a new collaboration from author Sarah Levine and illustrator T.S. Spooky Tooth, the team that brought us Bone by Bone, Tooth by Tooth, and Fossil by Fossil. Like these earlier books, Eye by Eye has a playful guessing game format asking questions such as, what kind of animal would you be if you had eight eyes? A spider. And what kind of animal would you be if your eyeballs were completely stuck in place? An owl. Readers will learn about the eyes of starfish, cats, goats, cuttlefish, and many other fascinating creatures. Back matter includes suggested activities to help kids understand how different animals see the world, as well as a glossary and further reading section. Wild Style is by Jenna Grodzicki, author of last fall's delightful nonfiction photo book, I See Seafood, Sea Creatures That Look Like Food. Wild Style is a fun look at the surprising variety of ways animals adorn themselves from a crab that wears a hat made of a sponge, to a flamingo that oils its feathers, to a lace swing larva that covers itself with debris to hide from ladybugs. The main text pairs engaging statements about each animal with further information that explains why these animals do what they do. And there are great photographs of all the animals so readers can see for themselves what they really look like. Back matter includes additional facts about the featured animals, as well as a glossary and further reading section. And next we have School Days, which is a bright and reassuring look at what happens throughout the school year. This book is wonderful for helping preschoolers prepare for starting school, as well as early elementary kids who are getting re ready to return to their school building, whether that happens at the beginning of the school year or sometime later once it's safe for children to gather in large groups again. The text was co-authored by Sheila Kelly and Shelley Rotner, the same team who brought us all kinds of friends, lots of feelings, and numerous other books. The photographs, all taken by Shelley Rotner, Depict a, depict a diverse range of kids at several different schools. The book covers everything from getting to school, morning meeting, reading and math, lunch and recess, classroom pets, and the occasional field trip. I also want to note that this is Sheila Kelly's final book. She was a long time ed educator and psychologist who was retired, and she passed away last summer while we were in the process of finishing this book. Shelley has dedicated the book to her. Moving on to a few science titles, we'll start with The Great Bear Rescue by Sandra Markle. Following the same format as Markle's earlier Great Rescue books, this one focuses on Gobi bears, which are the rarest bears on Earth. At the moment, the total population is estimated to be fewer than 40 bears. They live in the Gobi Desert in Mongolia and are primarily vegetarian, which makes them distinct from all other bear species. This book features some absolutely adorable photos of the bears, and Markle was able to interview the key scientists working to help this critically endangered species, and primary source quotations from the scientists are included throughout. Back matter includes an author's note, a comprehensive timeline, a glossary, further reading and websites, and an index. You may be familiar with Masha Dianz's wonderful illustrations in the book Flower Talk, How Plants Use Color to Communicate, which came out just over a year ago and was a finalist for the Cook Prize. In this new book, A Garden in Your Belly, Dianz is both author and illustrator. She gives a very accessible introduction to the gut microbiome, also known as the garden in your belly. And she tells readers what they can do to take care of this amazing garden. The book emphasizes the importance of healthy eating, but from a different perspective than what kids normally hear. Colorful illustrations help readers imagine a garden inside their bellies, and back matter includes further information about the microbiome, as well as a glossary and some amazing gut facts. 
Bionic Beasts by Jolene Gutierrez is a great STEM title that brings together biology and engineering through the stories of five different animals from around the globe that are thriving thanks to their prosthetic body parts. There's Lola, a Kemp's Ridley sea turtle, Moshe, an Asian elephant, Cassidy, a German shepherd, Vittoria, a gray leg goose, and Pirate, a Berkshire Tamworth pig. Each of these animals was at risk of dying due to their circumstances, but humans intervened and using a variety of techniques and technologies, including surgery, 3D printing, and more, they were able to create prosthetics that enabled these animals to survive. The author is a teacher librarian who contacted and interviewed many of the people involved with these animals, and her excellent research allows her to tell detailed stories of what happened with these animals and how humans were able to help. Sidebars provide more information about the different animal species, and there's also a hands-on activity in each chapter that enables readers to better understand the engineering concepts involved with the prosthetic body parts. The back matter includes a glossary, source notes, selected bibliography, links to further resources, and an index. And Living Fossils looks at some amazing animal survivors. Did you know that in the history of life on this planet, 99.9% .9 of, of all species have gone extinct, but a few have survived almost unchanged. In this book, author Rebecca E. Hirsch introduces us to six living fossils, including the chambered nautilus, which is on the cover, the horseshoe crab, and the platypus. In addition to sharing information about these fascinating animals, Hirsch talks about extinction and evolution more generally, offering a comprehensive explanation of evolution for readers who might not yet be very familiar with it. In the conclusion, Hirsch addresses why so many creatures alive right now are endangered and touches on the need to help preserve the diversity of life on our planet. The book also features a fascinating timeline of the history of animal life on Earth. Back matter includes a glossary, further reading section, and an index. And finally, I'd like to share several picture books. We'll start with Behind the Bookcase. Written by Barbara Lowell, it offers a unique perspective on the story of Anne Frank. Meep Geese worked for Otto Frank in his office, and when the Frank family was forced to go into hiding, she did what she could to help take care of them and keep them hidden from the Nazis. Interestingly, Meep herself had been displaced from her own home as a child during World War I, and she had great empathy for Anne. Beautifully illustrated by Valentina Toro, the book also shows how Meep recovered Anne's diary after the Frank family was taken away and how she returned it to Otto Frank at the end of the war, which is how we all know Anne Frank's story. Back Matter includes several photos of Meep as well as further information about her childhood, the Nazi invasion of the Netherlands, and the Frank family. It concludes with source notes, a bibliography, and further reading. And continuing with the World War II theme, August 2020 will mark 75 years since the end of World War II, which is also 75 years since the atomic bombs were dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. To commemorate that anniversary, we're releasing A Bowl Full of Peace, a true story written by Karen Stelson and illustrated by Akira Kusaka. Stelson is the author of Sachiko, a Nagasaki bomb survivor story, which received the Jane Addams Children Book Award, the Flora Stieglitz Strauss Award, and a Cybert Honor. Here, she tells part of Sachiko Yasui's story for a younger audience. The book centers around Grandmother's Bowl, a ceramic bowl that resembles leaves of lettuce. The book opens with the bowl being passed from Sachiko's grandmother to her mother, and we see snapshots of the family's life as World War II progresses and grandmother's bowl holds less and less to eat. Young Sachiko and her family try to make the best of things even when they have so little. On August 9, 1945, the day the United States dropped the atomic bomb on Nagasaki, six-year-old Sachiko was playing outdoors with her friends. 
They are about half a mile from the bomb's hypocenter, and all of Sachiko's friends are killed, but Sachiko miraculously survives. In the weeks that follow, all three of her brothers die. Sachiko's family leaves Nagasaki for a time, and when they are finally able to return to the rubble where their house once stood, her father finds grandmother's bowl intact under the rubble. The bowl takes on tremendous importance for the family, and every year on the anniversary of the bombing, Sachiko's mother places ice in the bowl and lets it melt. She says, we must never forget what happened on this day. Remember how a chip of ice eased our thirst? As the ice melts, let us remember all who suffered and all who died. We must pray that such a terrible war never happens again. Akira Kusaka's illustrations are simple yet profound, and at times they incorporate visual metaphors to convey the events of the book while remaining appropriate for a young audience. Despite the heavy subject matter, the book ends with Sachiko as an adult, sharing her story with children so they will know what happened and work together for a more peaceful future. Back matter includes further background information and context, an illustrator's note recommended further reading, and several family photos of Sachiko, as well as a recent photo of Grandmother's Bowl. Next, we have The Most Beautiful Thing by Kao Kalia Yang, whose debut picture book, A Map into the World, came out in fall of 2019, receiving two starred reviews, as well as being named a Charlotte Zoltau honor book. This new book is about something that not many picture books address, everyday life in a poor family. The nonfiction narrative alternates between Yang's childhood in Minnesota and the childhood of her beloved grandmother who grew up in Laos. When young Kalia wants ice cream, she has to make a do with ice cubes from the freezer. When she wants a new dress for the first day of school, her mother gives her a few coins to spend on candy at the corner store. And when she wants meat in her soup, she must settle for a piece of bone that flavors the broth. Yet running through the story is an undercurrent of love. Kalia's grandmother appreciates the little that the family has, and when Kalia becomes unhappy about having to do without and decides that she wants braces to improve her smile, it is her grandmother, a woman who has just one tooth in her mouth, who helps Kalia to see that true beauty is found with those we love most. The illustrations are absolutely incredible. They're by Kwa Le, who lives in Vietnam. While Lei herself is not Hmong, she is familiar with traditional Hmong clothing and textiles, and you'll see, depicted, well, you'll see that depicted on the end pages as well as in the scenes set in Laos. Next up, our sports-loving dinos continue their holiday celebrations with Dino Thanksgiving. With their trademark enthusiasm, the dinos prepare a great feast and give thanks. The book includes all sorts of fun details, including a spectacular airport scene in which illustrator Barry Gott channels Richard Scarry's Busy Town books. There's also a corn maze, a televised parade with the giant balloon creations, and everyone's favorite, a football game between the Snackers and the Red Scales, the two teams featured in the book Dino Football. And never fear, the carnivores and veggie enjoy separate meals, so no dinos were harmed in the making of this book. Lisa Wheeler's rhyming verse is a delight to read aloud, and this story will leave readers feeling thankful for food, family, and dinosaurs. For our final Calrota picture book this fall, we have a brand new adventure for the ever resourceful Chico Bonbon. The story begins with a crisis at the Superstar Space Station and Snack Bar. The moon malt machine is broken. Chico and Clark jump aboard their spacecraft, the Banana Five, and blast off to the rescue. Once they arrive, they have some trouble determining exactly what the problem is with the moon malt machine. But in the meantime, Chico finds a number of other things in need of repair. A hatch, a latch, and a droid's underwear. And then, whoosh, going. what was that? It turns out 
that an itty bitty adorable alien named Zudi had been hiding out in the malt machine, which is why it wasn't working. Chico and Clark embark on a chaotic chase through the space station before catching Zudi. With the help of a translator droid, that very droid with the underwear in need of repair, they learn that Zudi is stranded far from home due to a broken down spaceship. Fortunately, Chico has just the tools needed to fix it. A grateful Zudi zooms towards home and Chico Clark and their new friends at the space station celebrate with moon malts. The, illustration, the illustrations include lots of fun details throughout, including my personal favorite, a pair of old school moon boots on Chico Bonbon. Bon. An animated Chico Bonbon bon series launched on Net Netflix in May. So if you enjoy the Monkey with the Tool Belt books, be sure to check out the show as well. The show features Chico Bonbon bon and Clark, along with additional members of the Fix-It Force, which help the residents of Blunderburg tackle a ridiculous range of problems, all while incorporating science concepts and problem-solving skills. Plus, the theme song is absurdly catchy. Thank you again for watching and listening, and I wish you good health and happy reading in the months to come.